Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This series was made possible in part through the generosity of Velforo, and we thank them for their support. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screens. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars, within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Carolyn Siebig. Carolyn is originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and has been a dietitian in the Washington, D.C. area since 2011. Currently, she is the kidney transplant dietitian at the George Washington University Hospital. She found her passion for renal nutrition when her nephew was born with only one kidney. In her career, she seeks out opportunities to educate the general public about the importance of early detection of kidney disease and the importance of a healthy diet for kidney health. In her spare time, you can find Carolyn walking all over Washington, D.C., taking pictures and searching for new and delicious restaurants or farmer's markets. Thank you, Carolyn, for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much, Molly, and it's a real pleasure to be back here at the AKF. Um, so now I'm just going to go ahead and just jump right in. So today we're talking about phosphorus and what to do, like why is phosphorus important, um, what happens when it's can go out of range of either too high or too low, how you can manage your phosphorus, and then tips to managing phosphorus during the holiday season. Because managing phosphorus anytime is a, can be overwhelming, but certainly when during the holiday season when you've got a lot of parties and dinners and things going on. So let's dive right in. First off, I kind of like, I always like talking about um, the kidney and what the kidney is and how it's important and what and how it affects us. So our kidney, we have two of them. Most of us are born with two kidneys and in each side in each kidney there is over one million nephrons. The nephron is the part of the kidney that filters our blood and removes the waste and removes the fluid. So when your kidneys are working properly or your nephrons are working properly, that's what filters your blood and you can go about your daily business. Um, but when your kidneys aren't working properly, that means that your nephrons are damaged and they're not able to filter your blood appropriately. Normal functioning kidneys, the nephrons filter 1,600 or yeah, 1,600 liters of blood a day, which is insane. But they are continuously working and filtering, and so that 1,600 liters of blood gets concentrated or goes back into your body, well, not back into your body because it's already there, but they remove the waste and it comes out in your, your, as urine, and it's about one and a half liters of waste a day. So about one two-liter bottle of urine, you, a normal kidney urinates. But when your kidneys aren't working the way that they should, you might end up on dialysis when, they're, when they've stopped functioning well enough to filter your blood and to clean out your your blood. So what ends up happening is you go on dialysis and that is what's going to clean your blood. If you can see the picture on your right, the orange is signifying your blood, the white function is signifying the dialysate. And what happens is through this process, your blood is being filtered and the waste products or these added electrolytes like potassium and phosphorus and things like that go through this filter from your blood to this dialysate and the dialysate goes back into the machine and your blood 
is goes back to you, cleaned and filtered, which you do this three times a week if you're on hemodialysis in center. If you're on PD, you, this is constantly happening in your abdomen. If you're on home hemo, this is happening when you are doing this at your house probably about five to six times a week. So phosphorus is the subject of our, <laughs> of our, our conversation today. And it's found in our food and it's really important. And the form of phosphorus that's found in our food and found in our blood is in the form of phosphate. And that is a phosphorus and oxygen and sulfur molecule. And it makes it larger. So it makes it harder for it to move through the phosphorus, uh, move through that membrane during dialysis. And because of this, and we have to be limit the amount of phosphorus that we eat. Phosphorus is very important. Why is there so much phosphorus in our food? Because it's very important to our, to our makeup. It is actually necessary for the production and storage of energy in our body. It is the main part of our energy molecule, which is called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So there's three phosphoruses for our energy molecule, and this is why you find it in so many of your, um, in so much food. And it's also important to our bone, building our bones and also our health. So about 85 to 90% of total body phosphorus is actually found in our bones and teeth. And then not only is it important for our energy, and important for building and keeping healthy, strong bones and teeth, it's also important for other parts of our body functions, like building fats and proteins and cell membranes and other daily activities. Um, we basically mo mainly hear about high phosphorus and why that's important to make sure that it's not too high because it can cause long-term damage, but it's not going to be immediately harmful. But if you have low phosphorus, which is rare, that can be immediately harmful. And that means if your phosphorus is below 1.5. The normal range is 3 to 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and your dietitian at your dialysis center is going over these with you. And very, very, very rarely is do you ever see a drop in phosphorus. But it can happen. So I always just like to let people know that it can cause, like, you know, neuromuscular disturbances. It could put you in a coma. You could, you know, and then leading to the worst outcome of death. <laughs> so low phosphorus is nothing to be... To, to be like taken lightly, but that's a very rare occurrence. Normally, it's a high phosphorus because it's found in all of our food. So what can we do? High phosphorus, also called hyperphosphatemia. Um, and like we've talked before, phosphorus is not well removed during dialysis because it is that large molecule and it is hard to move through that barrier or that membrane. And chronic high phosphorus can lead to bone disease weak and brittle bones, or calcifications of your arteries, your veins, your eyes, your muscles. And remember, your organs are muscles too. And phosphorus, this, I want you guys to keep this in mind when we're going through this. Phosphorus plus calcium basically equals bone. So bone disease. If your, if your body is made up of, you know, your bones are made up of 85 to 90% of the phosphorus that's found in your body, you're like, well, if I have high phosphorus, then that's gonna go back into my bones and that's gonna be good. But that's not the case. So when you have too much phosphorus building up in your system, it's not gonna go into your bones because your bones have enough phosphorus. What will end up happening is you'll have extra phosphorus in your blood. Phosphorus and calcium are like best friends. So what will happen is your body will pull the calcium from your bones into your into your veins to be to be to like counterbalance the phosphorus in your blood and that will then can cause making your bones weak and brittle also kidney disease causes pro problems with the way that our body uses vitamin d and that can and also in turn lead to our bones becoming brittle and weak so a lot of times bone disease does not show any symptoms until it's so it's pretty far gone until it's fairly severe. You may not know that you have bone disease because of dialysis and high phosphorus and you know the way that your, your body is not using the vitamin D correctly until all of a sudden you break a bone. And that might be the first symptom 
that you actually notice. So not only can it lead to bone disease, it can lead to what's called caliphylaxis. Caliphylaxis is a long and hard word to say, and I certainly can't spell it, and it took me a long time to figure out how to say it when I looked at it. Um, but what it is, is basically it's calcification. So when your phosphorus is high, your body needs to pull out calcium to make the balance in your blood appropriate. Well, like I said earlier, phosphorus plus calcium basically equals bone. And they're like best friends, so they always want to hang out together. So if you have high phosphorus, you're going to be pulling more calcium from your bones. And then those little guys are going to get together. They're going to nestle in your veins, in your organs, in your eyes. And what will end up happening is you're going to build up these calcium and phosphorus crystals in your blood vessels, in your soft tissue, in your skin, in your organs, and they will become hard like, like a crystal or, or bone. The advancement of these calcifications, when you have a lot of these calcifications, that can lead to caliphylaxis, which is that hard, long word. So when you have a lot of this buildup of these calcium and phosphorus in your skin, it can lead to skin ulcers or wounds, and they can become very painful and they can get infected, which then can also lead to hospitalization and possibly death. Um, the skin ulcers, because of the caliphylaxis, is the end stage result of too high of PTH, too high calcium, too high phosphorus, too high in vitamin D when they're not well managed. If you are on dialysis, your dietitian and your doctor and your nurses are all working with you to make sure that this isn't happening. And you can avoid things like this. So the, if you see these pictures, you see the, uh, the picture on the left are some of those skin wounds that we were talking about. Um, and then the picture on the right is this person's fingertips are blackened. And that's because the veins and the arteries to these tips of the fingers have been so calcified that blood can't get there and there's no longer blood flow to the tips of these. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And this is why your dietitians are always, you know, constantly talking to you about maintain your phosphorus, make sure it's not too high because we don't want to end up with any type of calcifications um, for you. So, like I said, caliphylaxis is the end result of long term. This is not going to happen if you have one high phosphorus or one high PTH but this is a long-term chronic high phosphorus, calcium, and PTH. But the good news is you can make sure that this doesn't happen to you by eating foods that are lower in phosphorus and making sure you're always taking your phosphorus binders every time you eat and drink. I'm going to say that again. By eating foods lower in phosphorus and making sure that you're taking your phosphorus binders every time you eat and drink. Beverages have phosphorus in them too. So how are we going to do this? Well, you need to, we need to talk about phosphorus in our diet. So we, need to, we want you to limit foods that are going to be higher in phosphorus to help keep your phosphorus within those normal limits. Because again, phosphorus is hard to remove during dialysis. Probably only a third of the phosphorus that is in your blood is actually removed during dialysis. So now you've got two-thirds of phosphorus still left in your blood, which then could lead to having too high a phosphorus. So phosphorus is highly absorbable, and it's found in most of our foods. Good rule of thumb is where there is protein, there is phosphorus. Because if you think about it, protein is important for muscles, and building of muscles and phosphorus is our energy source. So where there's protein, there's going to be phosphorus. So foods that are high, naturally high in phosphorus are going to be your meats, your whole grains, your dairy, beans, and nuts, all foods high in phosphorus or and protein. And then also, these are all foods that are high in potassium. So not only are you having to worry about monitoring your phosphorus, you have to be worried about monitoring your potassium. Foods that are pretty much have no or low phosphorus are going to be your fruits and vegetables. So... What else, where else is there phosphorus? It's found in many of the processed foods. And we have to be really, really, really careful when buying any food that you find in a package or a can or a bag or a box, anything 
that is not the natural source like an apple, you have to be careful and you've got to make sure that you are reading those ingredients because of the addition of those phosphorus additives. I'm sure you've talked to your dietitian before and she's or he is always talking about phosphorus additives. You've got to watch out for those added phosphoruses. So, or is it phosphori? I don't know. <laughs> Just a little like English humor um, <laughs> or grammar humor, I guess. But really, you have to become a phosphorus detective, and that is because it is not on our nutrition label. And pretty much anybody in the kidney world who's battling with this is frustrated by that. But we're very happy because potassium is now made it onto the nutrition label. So now we have our calories. We have the amount of sodium that's in there. We've got the total amount of carbohydrates, and we've got how much potassium is in the foods that we're eating. So that is, that's a great win for us, but we still don't know how much phosphorus. That is why you have to become a phosphorus detective, because you will be able to find out if your food has added phosphorus. Because we already know the foods that have natural phosphorus, meats, beans, nuts, dairy, whole grains, but we've got to figure out what foods have that phosphorus added. So if you're buying food in a box or a bag, there is a very good chance it's going to have some type of added phosphorus. All packaged foods must have an ingredient list. And the ingredients are listed in the order of amount. So the top of the list, the more that product. The bottom of the list, the less of that product in that in that you know food item. So if the ingredient has the word phosphorus in it, that means it's going to have phosphorus. If you look at this new in, in, nutrition ingredient label, you're going to see there's two arrows, and that means that there's two different types of phos added phosphorus in this food. So if you look through, do, 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 oh look, there's phosphoric acid, and then you keep on looking, and then oh there's disodium phosphate. So nothing that actually says the word phosphorus, it, you have, that's another way that you're going to have to become a phosphorus detective. You have to look for P-H-O-S. So these are some of the common phosphorus additives that you are going to find in your food. These are not all of them, but these are the common ones. Phosphoric acid, I mean, like, and you really have to be a detective because what are these words? What is hexametaphosphate? I have no idea but it's something that preserves the food and has added phosphorus in it. So you have to make sure that you're finding these words in these ingredient lists, and that makes it difficult. And the ingredient list is normally pretty small, so make sure if you need <laughs> to bring your glasses with you to the store. Um, so foods that have added phosphorus, well known, we know about the pancakes and the biscuit mixes, the fast foods, frozen dinners, lunch meats, hot dogs, Breading mixes, like things that you might see, like one of those, um, like breadings that you might coat meat with, or like a fried chicken breading, hot dog and hamburger buns, but things that are less well known, food, food items that are less well known, white rice. So a lot of times we used to talk about, oh, well, eat the white rice and eat the white breads because they don't have whole grains and they don't have all that much phosphorus in them. Well, white rice now is being supplemented with ferric phosphate. So they're giving, they're adding back some iron into this rice, but they're doing it with the phosphorus. White breads have a lot of added phosphorus and makes it shelf stable. Non-dairy creamers, so now like um, those liquid dairy creamers or those powdered dairy creamers that we used to say, hey, those are great for you to choose when you're on dialysis because it doesn't have any dairy. Now we're being added with added phosphorus and that will then also raise your phosphorus. So that's why you really got to make sure, even if you're having a cup of coffee with some type of creamer in it, you got to take a binder. Um, cool Whip or those frozen like things that substitute um, whipped cream, those have added phosphorus. Prepackaged meats, not the lunch meats. These are like the types of meats, like if you go to the grocery store and you see some ground meat and it's in a um, package that's, it has a deep bowl and then it has a cover on the top, like a shrink wrap on the top, but there's there's air around it. That air is actually not just like normal air. That is air that's making it, that's preserving it, which is full of nitrogen and phosphorus. And some of that phosphorus leaches into the meat. 
So you got to make sure if you're going to go to the butcher and buy some ground meat or some turkey, make sure that that is actually just sealed and wrapped on. There's no air in between. Like the, the wrapping is touching the meat product. Uh, rice and soy milks and almond milk, a lot of them have added phosphorus. Uh, Jello, Tums, or like and I, any of those antacids, you got to read the labels because there are a lot of them that don't have it, but the, some of them do have a top of phosphorus in it. And tuna, canned tuna, albacore tuna has added phosphorus. So you got to read your canned tuna because that is a great source of protein, but it's going to have natural phosphorus and added phosphorus. So you find the tuna that does not have, I think it's just like light white packed in water chunk tuna. But you just go and you, you have to read those labels. And you have to read the labels all the time. I mean, I would suggest reading, finding your favorite foods. And then every six months, you got to recheck that because they change the ingredients and how they make them. So you've got to stay on top of it, keeping a running list of foods. This is the ranch dressing that doesn't have it. This is the lunch meat that doesn't have any added phosphorus. Doing those types of tricks and strategies throughout, but then check because maybe next month they've changed the formula of how they make it. And so checking twice a year is a really good way to make sure that the foods that used to not have phosphorus additives still don't have phosphorus additives. Um, and the reason this is such a big deal is because they're really, really, really damaging to people on dialysis. Our body absorbs 100% of those added phosphorus, of those, you know, synthetic phosphoruses um, that are not natural to the food. So, and the other thing is our body does not absorb 100% of natural phosphorus. Phosphorus is found normally in those foods. So foods that have high natural levels of phosphorus, like dairy and meat and whole grains and beans and nuts, are better phosphorus options than something that has a whole bunch of added phosphorus. Now, you got to make sure that your potassium is within normal limits if you're going to start eating a whole bunch of these foods, like the dairy and the beans and the nuts, because they do have a lot, and the whole grains, and meat, because they all have a lot of potassium. So this is when you're working with your dietitian and your doctor and your nurses at your dialysis center because what we want to do is balance protein, phosphorus, and potassium to make sure everything is working properly. So our body absorbs 100% of those phosphorus additives. It absorbs 80% of the natural phosphorus found in dairy. It absorbs 60% of the natural phosphorus found in meats and beans and nuts, and it absorbs about 40% of the natural phosphorus found in grains. And you got to keep that phosphorus in that sweet spot. And that sweet spot is the 3.0 to 5.5. This means that your blood levels of phosphorus are in normal range. You're not pulling out calcium. They're not clogging up your arteries with these little crystals. And this is what your, and your bones are staying healthy. Um, and this is what's going to help you keep a high energy level, good strong bones and teeth, and keep your body working in the right way. So now we know that there is phosphorus in all types of food, most of the foods that we eat, and all the foods that have a lot of protein. How do we then avoid this? We avoid it by limiting how much phosphorus we eat, but that's hard to do, and then taking a phosphorus binder. These phosphorus binders, most of you are probably on a phosphorus binder or heard of these phosphorus binders. Um, they're very, very, very important to our to managing your phosphorus. Um, they act like a phosphorus net. You take the pill, it breaks down in your stomach, it opens up, and when you eat, it traps the phosphorus, and then you remove it through your stool. Because um, remember, once you eat that phosphorus and your body absorbs it, it's not 
remove that well during dialysis. So it's best not to eat too much phosphorus, but really it's best not to absorb that much phosphorus and have it in our system. It's recommended to take phosphorus binders in between five to 15 minutes before eating. Um, the reason we recommend five to 15 minutes before eating is because it's your body needs time to break down that, that pill, that binder, to make sure that it opens up into that big old phosphorus net that I like to th think of. And this makes the, bi the binder work better. However, we're all human and we forget things. So what happens when you forget to take your binder five to 15 minutes before your meal or your snack? Well, take it right before or right with the first couple of bites. That's the best. If you forget and you think and you're eating in the middle of your meal, and you're like, oh, dang it, I forgot my binder. Take it then, and that's okay. If you've finished your meal and you're like, oh, that was delicious, but something's missing. What did I forget? Oh, I forgot my binder. Take it then. It's better than nothing. But let's say it's been a half an hour, an hour or so after your meal, and you're like, oh, dang it, I forgot my binder. Eh, it's really not going to do too much. So you know, you don't really need to take it then because you've already, the phosphorus has already passed through your system and has been absorbed. Um, different types of binders, people are on all different types. There are pretty much five different classic or types of binders. Uh, they're made with either non-absorbable subst substances like selvamir. Um, some of them are made with calcium. Some are made with um, other non-absorbable substances. Uh, some are made with iron, some are chewable, some are not chewable, but they all have that same basic function of being there to catch that phosphorus. So the other thing is they don't find all of the phosphorus that we eat. Because remember, phosphorus is important. It's important for our energy, it's important for our bones, but it's important to be in the right levels, in that sweet spot. So the average binder binds about 40 to 100 milligrams of phosphorus, depending on the different binders and how many binders you're taking and things like that. So just to put that in a little bit of perspective, we are always telling people to eat lean protein, you need more protein, protein's important for people on dialysis, and that is 100% true. But a half of a skinless chicken breast, which is about three ounces or the size of your palm, is 196 milligrams of phosphorus. Remember, our body absorbs about 60% of that phosphorus found in chicken or meat. And that 60% six, so of 196 is 118 milligrams. So just remember, just because it's important for you to eat protein, it, you still need to take those binders because you are still going to be absorbing some. And just because you take one binder, maybe if you're eating a large phosphorus meal, then you might need to take extra because it's not gonna bind up all of that phosphorus. So some phosphorus tips, um, avoiding prepackaged foods as much as possible, anything in a bag, box, or can, and if you are, you've gotta read those labels. Finding foods that don't have the added phosphorus on the label, there are ranch dressings and snack uh, crackers and lunch meats out there that don't have added phosphorus. Keep a running list of the, the products that you find. You know, smartphones now are amazing. I mean, I can't imagine what we used to do without them. You can just always have a grocery, like a list on your phone saying, these are products, these are the name brands that I found that don't have any added phosphorus. And then once every two, you know, once every six months, check just to make sure. Um, cook, it, cook at home. When you go out to eat, you are not in control. When you cook at home, you are in control. You're in control of, did you buy food that had added phosphorus? Did you not buy food that had added phosphorus? Are you adding more sodium? You are in control when you're cooking at home. So cooking at home is one of the most important things you can do for your phosphorus control. Um, also avoiding fast food. Fast food is, gonna, is notorious for prepackaged uh, foods and things like that and processed foods. So if you can at all possibility, avoiding the fast foods. And then staying away from any type of fluid that is in a can or a bottle. 
you have a fluid limit, 32 ounces a day if you're on dialysis. Um, choose water. It doesn't have any added phosphorus. But certainly stay away from colas. Even some root beers, orange sodas, bottled teas, bottled coffees, they can all have added phosphorus. So always, always, always read the label. Um, other phosphorus tips. Increase your daily activity. This is going to do so much for just everyday life for you. It's going to burn extra phosphorus because of our energy molecule. It's going to use up extra potassium. If you really start moving and you start sweating, you're going to get rid of some extra fluid. You're going to burn calories. You're going to feel better. Um, always taking your binders before you eat. If you can remember to do that, that is huge because you've now opened up that phosphorus net from that binder. Um, taking an extra binder, if you do find yourself eating something that you know is high in phosphorus or you're out at a fast food restaurant or something like that. And then keeping binders in different places so you always have some nearby. If you like to snack on the couch, have them on the couch. If you like to always have them on, some on your kitchen table, um, put them in your glove compartment. Once before someone has asked me if like when it's hot outside, does that affect the phosphorus binder? No, it doesn't. I asked my pharmacist. Um, and now it's winter, so it really won't affect it. Always have some in your wallet or purse. Just have some with you at all times. So that way when you're out and about and you find yourself at a restaurant, you're like, dang it, I don't have any. But you're like, aha, I do because I'm smart and I planned ahead. So now let's talk about the holidays. Not only is managing your phosphorus every, every single day overwhelming, when it's the holiday season, it's even more so. And a lot of times people think, well, it's just easier for me now that I have kidney disease not to go to this party, not to be festive with my family, not to do these things that you used to love to do and that can make you sad and feel isolated and that's no good. So hopefully these following slides are going to help you with navigate some of these what I like to call holiday phosphorus pitfalls. So, general, use a smaller plate. Smaller plate, smaller portion size, less phosphorus eaten. Just, there you go, right? Um, serving size. Serving size is big. Again, kind of follows that smaller plate idea. Box stuffings, like, um, people make homemade stuffings, and I think that's amazing, but boy, oh boy, I love those box stuffings, and I would always rather just have that on my, <laughs> on my Thanksgiving plate, but that's me. But those box stuffings pretty much have added phosphorus. So you, if you're like me and you love those stuffings and you can't live without it on Thanksgiving or Christmas, take a smaller scoop. Think about like a computer mouse that size or a tennis ball that size. It's about, you know, a little bit under a half a cup. If you cup your hand and you imagine it being full but not overflowing, that's a good size. Take your favorite things, but don't skip them. But don't, you know, like get a little bit so that way you don't feel deprived. Don't skip, but don't go back for seconds and don't have heaping portions of them. And certainly always skip the seconds. Bring your binders to any, just, you know, always have some in your wallet, your purse, your glove compartment. It's just a good habit to be in. And be active, again, with that activity. Ways to be active and festive at the same time. Maybe people come in from, from out of town. Maybe you're going out of town to visit family and friends. Well, there's a lot of catching up to do. Go on a walk before or after your meal. Now you're using that your energy molecule, that ATP, and you're burning some extra phosphorus and calories while catching up with your friends and your family and doing things and you're not just, and also probably that person who's making that big old dinner is gonna be really happy if you just got everybody out of the kitchen. Um, maybe you host and you've gotta have a clean house. Dance while you're cleaning house. Any type of extra movement, you're gonna be burning that phosphorus. So also maybe you just constantly have people over all the time during that holiday season. So always keep a clean house. Every day when you get home from work or when you wake up in the morning or whatnot, do a little bit of cleaning here and there. Um, do your own grocery shopping. 
This way you get to spend the energy walking around the grocery store and you get to look at the label and make sure it doesn't have any added phosphorus. When you go shopping, park farther away. And maybe walking is difficult or painful for you. That's okay. Maybe instead of parking right next to the door, you park two spots away from the door. That's fine. Any little bit helps. If you can, take the stairs. Always take the stairs. It burns more phosphorus, and it helps <laughs> it helps build uh, thigh muscles. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't taken the stairs in a while and then walks up a couple of flights, you're like, oh, geez, how did, <laughs> what happened there? Um, but just remember, the more things you do, the more activity, the more you're moving, the more phosphorus you use. Then there's also some questions to, to think about before the holiday season, like who hosts those holiday dinners? Maybe it's Aunt Nancy, and Aunt Nancy is always hosting the, to the holiday dinner. Um, what are your, your traditional dishes on your holiday table? Um, I can tell you right now, for me and my family, it's something called Aunt Beth's potatoes, and I love Aunt Beth's potatoes, and I love stuffing. Those are pretty much my two favorite things for the holidays. But you have to think to yourself, which ones are high in phosphorus? Which ones are high in potassium? Which ones of your favorite dishes do you, do you need to like navigate away from or choose smaller amounts? Um, can you make a dish and make it to be lower in phosphorus or lower in potassium? Because not only is phosphorus a big deal during the holidays, so is potassium. Um, and plan ahead. That is, having a game plan is so important. Having a game plan for these different activities and parties and meals helps you be successful when navigating these holiday pitfalls, right? And not only is it during the holidays do you get a lot of added phosphorus, you also get a lot of extra calories. So following these tips to monitoring your phosphorus can also help you monitor your, um, your calorie intake too. And maybe you won't gain the extra 5 to 10 pounds that most of us do over the holidays. So again, planning ahead. Who's hosting the meal? Is it Aunt Nancy? If it is, tell them that you're managing your, your kidney disease and your kidney diet. Um, maybe it's your good friend. Let them know. They want to help. Um, you can even provide them a list of kidney-friendly foods. There are plenty of printable lists out there. The American Kidney Fund has some. I mean, just you can search these out and find them and print them out and say, hey, Aunt Nancy, go ahead and print this. Uh, or choose foods that are like these. Ask for the menu ahead of time so that way you can plan and figure out different foods to eat and your, your game plan and your strategy. Ask to bring a dish or two. You can say, hey, I'm going to bring, you know, let me bring the potatoes or let me bring the side dish or let me bring the this. Because if you're going to bring the potatoes, then you can dialyze those potatoes and make them a little bit lower in potassium. Um, eat before the party. If you're going to a party, eat before it, hands down, absolutely. And then stand with your back to the buffet. Stand away from the snack dish. Don't stand in the kitchen where you're just snacking. If you're standing away and you're not seeing these appetizers and these snacks and these desserts, then you're not going to eat them because it's more of a pain and you're not thinking about it. Um, and if you eat before, then you can take your binders. Chew gum. Chew gum when you're at the party. That way, no one wants to like eat some like pretzels and then chew gum. That's gonna that's gross. Um, bring your binders with you if you aren't able to eat before or something like that. Have them in your car. Have them in your wallet. Have them in your purse just in case. Just in case you decide that you want to spit out your gum and then eat some pretzels. Right? That's that's the way to do it. Make sure you always have those binders. Um, and then if you're hosting the holidays. Skip taste testing. As we know, phosphorus is in pretty much everything. And it's those little bites, licks, and tastes, those BLTs, that get in the way and they can smallly drive up your phosphorus. And you can't take a binder and then taste this and then take another binder and then taste that. So have somebody be your designated taste tester, somebody that you that you know has a good palate and you know, likes the food the same way you like it. Dialyze your potatoes or squashes, those hard squashes. Um, talk to your dietitian at your dialysis center. She will or he will have a, they'll be able to tell you how to dialyze your potatoes, but you also probably already know how to do that. And just because you dialyze your potatoes does not mean that it does not have any potassium in it. There is still some. Um, invest in disposable Tupperware. 
You make the meal, you have this wonderful meal, send every single guest home with leftovers and some disposable Tupperware. That way, you do not eat the added, the higher phosphorus dishes and those extra calories. And then we're going to talk about some kidney-friendly snacks, appetizers, and desserts in these next few slides. So make your snacks lower in phosphorus and potassium, peppermints, candy canes, Chex Mix that you make, peppermint patties. Yeah, there's a little bit of chocolate on there, but, you know, those are okay. Avoid the nuts, chocolate cheeses, and snack crackers, and, you know, salamis and all that stuff with added phosphorus. Make a lower phosphorus and potassium veggie and dip tray. Choose low potassium vegetables like bell peppers and cauliflower and broccoli, radishes, carrots, all sorts of things. Cucumbers. I know the AKF just loves cucumbers. We were just talking about how much they like them um, earlier today. And then make a low phosphorus dip. You can do that, and it's great. You can use some cream cheese. Soften up that cream cheese. Add a bunch of different herbs and spices. I personally really like garlic powder, dried basil, and oregano, a little bit of red pepper flakes. You mix it all together and bam, you've got a delicious dip tray. You can also find a low sodium or uh, taco tray or taco um, package seasoning mix and you can have like taco dip. You could do that with like a no phosphorus added um, ranch dressing packet make a ranch drip, dip. All sorts of different things that you can do when you look at the labels and find um, nothing, no phosphorus added. Chex mix. I, I mean, I feel like everybody eats Chex mix during the holidays. You can make your own. So tips for making a Chex mix that's kidney friendly. Skip the nuts. Add extra herbs and spices to cut back or avoid those, like those salts, the seasoning salt, the, the garlic salt, the celery salt. Use half the amount of butter because they, it's just too much butter. So just use half the amount and it'll be better on your waistline and phosphorus line. Here's a whole bunch of different types of Chex Mix from the Chex Mix website, which we give you later on in this presentation. But there's so many different kinds. Who knew? There's a chili lime. There's a taco. There's a caramel apple. There's a, like a go on fish one. And they use like little fun goldfish and um, goldfish pretzels. Then the original Chex Mix, if you do it without the nuts and half the seasoning salt, honey garlic Chex Mix, a churro Chex Mix. Instead of that, so those muddy buddies with the chocolate and the powdered sugar, you could do a churro Chex Mix. And that is great. These are all really good um, options. Dessert. You can bring your own dessert. You can make your own dessert. Uh, shortbread cookies. You can have a fruit tray or a fruit salad. I know that people are probably not that excited about that. But wow, that's a really, if you get some really delicious fruit, not anything too high in phosphorus and definitely no star fruit, but that is a really good calorie-friendly, low phosphorus dish. Or you can make some angel food cake or buy an angel food cake and make a strawberry sauce. All you got to do, quarter some fresh strawberries, take a fourth of a cup of strawberry jam and a tablespoon of water, put in a small little saucepan, bring it to a simmer, turn it down, stir it, and when those strawberries have broken down, now you've got a lovely strawberry sauce. Top it with some mint and sliced strawberries, and bam, that's beautiful. And you can also check out the American Kidney Fund. Uh, they've got a wonderful holiday-friendly recipes. The Vita's got a whole bunch of different recipes, and then the Chex Mix recipe. Um, all of those Chex Mix that I just listed were are on the recipes are on that website. I went through all those recipes, and I found the ones that were the best for the kidneys. So now. You are a master detective for the holidays and for the rest of the year. Reading the food label, choosing foods that don't have added phosphorus, choosing foods low in phosphorus. Now you are prepared to go to those holiday parties and those dinners. And you're going to remember to bring and take your binders. And you're going to increase your daily activity level. And that is what makes you a master phosphorus detective. Um, here are some of our references, again, the Chex Mix. Thank you, everyone. I hope you found this entertaining and informative. Uh, please let me know any questions that you have. All right. Well, thank you again, Carolyn, for joining us and leading such an excellent webinar. 
At this time, I'd like to ask you uh, to answer a few questions that we received over the course of the webinar. And we received a lot. <laughs> oh, well, I, I hope I'm up to the challenge. All right, so number one, um, how long does it take for the body to get rid of phosphorus that it doesn't use? Oh, well, um, if your kidneys are working normally or uh, appropriately, then really no time at all because our body is filtering the blood. But when your kidneys aren't working, it takes a really long time because phos or because dialysis is not removing it. I do not have a time. It depends on how active you are and how um, well your dialysis is goes for you. Great. And then somebody asked for us to please return to the slide that has all the names of various phosphorus additives. So here we have it displayed again. So if you want to take a quick screenshot, now would be the time to do that. Also, I mean, just a little FYI, very soon, probably sometime early 2019 or so, this list will be on the American Kidney Fund um, website. So uh, always check back there for new and updated uh, information. Yes, absolutely. Um, so our next question is, uh, what tests are done to check for phosphorus, and how do I look for it in the blood and urine test report? Okay, so if you are on dialysis, then it is checked monthly during your monthly blood draws. Uh, if your phosphorus is high and you're on dialysis, it'll be checked twice a month. And your dietitian will come around and give you those those um, results. There's really nothing else. Uh, like if you're, let's say you are not on dialysis, but you go and see your nephrologist or your kidney doctor, they're going to be checking for that too, and they're going to let you know if your phosphorus is high. Let's say you don't have a nephrologist and you just like to listen to my presentation, and I appreciate that. Um, when you go to your annual checkup with your doctor. They should check for it, but if they don't, you can always just say, hey, will you check for my phosphorus? And I know there was a second part to that question, but I can't remember what it was. That was it. Uh, oh. Just how do we check for phosphorus in blood and urine tests? Oh, okay. It's not in your urine. It's only in your blood. Great. So the next question, the person says, I've always heard that phosphorus binders do not work for liquids like soft drinks and milk. Is that true? I've never heard that. I am not a um, pharmacist, or so I have not heard that. So I can't speak to that, but I don't believe that to be true. All right. The next question: If I'm on dialysis and I take my phosphorus binders, um, I won't absorb 100% of the added phosphorus in the processed foods, right? What you will do is those phosphorus binders will bind up 40 to 100 milligrams of the phosphorus that you have ingested. Some of that will be natural phosphorus. Some of that will be at the added phosphorus. But if you're eating foods that have natural phosphorus plus added phosphorus, then it's a double whammy. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, I mean, avoiding those phosphorus additives will help you absorb less phosphorus. Got it. All right. Next question is, is constipation a common side effect of phosphorus binders? Yes. Not only do they bind phosphorus, they bind everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then you don't, you're not eating a very high fiber diet because of phosphorus and uh, potassium because the foods that have a lot of fiber have a lot of phosphorus and potassium and you don't get to drink very much because you're on a fluid restriction, um, which makes constipation a a major um, a major complaint for most people on dialysis. Talk to your di uh, your to your nephrologist or dietitian for recommendations on different medications. Also, being active helps with constipation. The more you move, the better your GI tract works. So. If you take anything away from today, be more active. Great. And take your binders. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, somebody asked us to go back to the slides with the holiday recipe sites. Oh. Um, so we've got that up on the screen for whoever asked for that. 
Um, so the next question is, uh, my nephrologist recommended that I take my binders after there is food in my stomach, not when my stomach is empty. Is that what you would recommend? So there's a lot of reasoning behind that. Um, sometimes when people take, but maybe you're taking five binders, right, per meal. That's a lot. That's a lot to sit on an empty stomach, and it might pe make people feel nauseous or something like that. I would recommend to take my binder, your binder maybe one before eating, and then the rest halfway through the meal. Um, all of the literature that I have read, peer review journals and things like that, um, have recommended taking the binders earlier versus later to help bind that, um, to bind the, most of the phosphorus. Great tip. All right, so next question. Um, will increasing the duration of my dialysis remove more phosphorus, and is this recommended? Um, talk to your doctor about increasing the duration of your dialysis because they are the one that sets that, and that is definitely a doctor-related question. But yes, <laughs> the longer you're on dialysis, the more your, your phosphorus would be removed. Okay, great. Next question, which meats are lower in phosphorus? Ooh, well, um, chicken is one of the lower ones. Uh, turkey is tuna. Salmon is surprisingly high in phosphorus. But if you think about it, um, the, the meats that are going to be, the leaner meats are lower in, in phosphorus. But you can go to some websites. My favorite is nutritiondata.com and it tells you, you you can type in beef and then choose different types of beef and you can find out how much phosphorus is in each one of those per serving. Great. So can someone count the phosphorus in diet colas as part of their daily allotment of phosphorus or a cola is just too dangerous? Oh, right. I, I am a, a huge Diet Cola fan, so I feel your pain. Um, I would not recommend drinking a whole bunch of Diet Cola or Cola, but if you just sometimes to make your soul feel better and you want to drink a Diet Cola, take a phosphorus binder with it. But it should not be something that you do on a daily basis you don't get that much fluid mm -hmm. allotment. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, next question, are canned or frozen vegetables better for you? Ah, I love this question. Um, frozen vegetables, absolutely, they're the best. Canned vegetables are heat processed. A lot of times they have a lot of added sodium things. Um, if you do have to do a canned vegetable, take the can, dump it in a colander, rinse the vegetable, you'll get rid of a lot of the added sodium, but frozen vegetables are even better, sometimes they're even better than fresh because they are frozen on site. They pick those vegetables, they chop them up and wash them, and then they pop them in a blast freezer and all of those nutrients are stored. So frozen, I love frozen vegetables. Great. So out of all these options, which would you recommend? Creamer, milk, or non-dairy creamer? I would recommend uh, whole milk. Okay. Yeah, whole milk has surprisingly the least amount of phosphorus and potassium. That is good to know. And I wouldn't use very much. Personally, I would learn to like black coffee. <laughs> I like to add cinnamon to mine. Nice, nice tip. <laughs> uh, next question, is it safe to take several binders a day? It's safe to do how, it's safe to take the binders how your doctor has recommended it. Um, many times people will take up to nine binders a day. So what you want to do is make sure that you don't overtake binders and then end up with low phosphorus because of those low phosphorus problems. So um, 
Yeah, absolutely. You got to talk to your doctor about that one. But let's say your phosphorus normally is normal and you're taking one or two binders with meals and then you go and you eat at a fast food place. Take an extra binder. That is safe. But doing it on a consistent basis without the recommendation of your doctor is not. Okay. So another popular question. Are Tums phosphate binders? They do bind phosphorus. Um, some Tums have added phosphorus. I personally like to recommend taking a off-brand or generic version. They're cheaper and a lot of times they don't have added phosphorus. This is something though you need to talk to your dietitian and your doctor about because you're, they also have calcium and your body does absorb that calcium and that could lead to problems. But I know that binders are, prescription binders are expensive. Some people fall into um, insurance issues and they need to take something like that, like a Tums or an antacid. So working with your dietitian at your dialysis center. Great. Next question. Can children with kidney disease take binders? I am not a pediatric um, dietitian. I do not feel comfortable. Do you, but their nephrologist and their dietitian would. Okay, great. Next question, um, is there an estimate of how much phosphorus you can release during exercise? I'm sure there is. I am not the person that knows that answer. I'm sorry. Okay, well, we'll call that person to talk to their doctor. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> um, so what about non-dairy creamers? So remember our previous question about creamers, milk, and... So non-dairy <laughs> creamers, um, you got to read those... Um, you got to read the ingredient labels because they really do. I think that they do have a lot of added phosphorus. I, I I feel like the liquid ones have more added phosphorus than the powdered ones, but I am sure somewhere out there there is a non-dairy creamer with only one or two added phosphoruses, phosphori, and um, but I choose milk over a non-dairy creamer. But people like hazelnut, you know, flavors and things like that, and they're lower in calories. So just read those labels. Mm -hmm. Choose the one with the least amount of added phosphorus. There we go. So what do you recommend for people with pre-dialysis CKD? Ah, well, that depends. So are you pre-dialysis stage one and two? If you are, I recommend eating a very well-balanced diet full of lean protein, high in vegetables, high in whole grains, high in fluid, meaning water. If you are CKD stage three and four, I recommend going to your nephrologist as much as possible. You probably need to limit your amount of protein that you're eating. You don't have to like, cut it 100% out, but you want to cut back on the amount of protein and you want to change your protein source from like red meat to more beans, lentils, chicken, and fish. Um, if you are CKD stage five, but not on dialysis, you're going to probably need to limit how much fluid you're drinking. You will look, a good way to check that out is by looking at your ankles, seeing if you're holding any fluid in, if you can push your finger in and it sits and there is an indentation that means you have too much fluid on. If you're having difficulty walking upstairs and you're gasping for breath or leaning back and you're gasping for breath and that's hard to lay down, then that might also be a signal that you have too much fluid on board, so you might want to cut back on fluid. Um, you also should really cut back on uh, protein. Again, choosing those leaner sources of protein, the fishes, the chickens, the beans, and the lentils, and then you want to make sure that you're not eating too much potassium. You'll have to work with your doctor, but eating low salt, high fruits and vegetables, whole grains. That was a really long um, explanation, and again, starting sometime in 2019, you can go to the AKF website and they'll have some good information on that for you. Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Carolyn. 
This concludes today's webinar. We will have a second webinar this month on eating healthy with diabetes and kidney disease. This webinar will be held on Wednesday, November 28th and hosted by registered dietitian Lori Martinez Hassett. Registration is open now. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us to make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again.